about the definition of natural log, which is probably one of the last things you learned when we went through exponentials and logs back in pre-calculus class. So here's where you'll learn why in the world we call this one the natural log. So I'll start out with the definition. So this is the definition. Natural log is the integral from 1 to x of the 1 over t dt function. And of course, you need x to be greater than 0. Why is that? Well, 1 over t has a vertical asymptote at 0. And if you integrate across that, you're going to have some problems. So let's graph the function we're going to integrate. So we'll graph the y equals 1 over t. So 1 over t has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So there's our vertical asymptote, x equals 0. And our function has the point 1, 1. And it also has a horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. There is a 1 over t graph on the left, but I'm not going to use it over here, so I'm not going to even bother graphing it. So I'm not going to graph the, any of the negative t values, because we're just going to stop at, I should write t equals 0, not x equals 0. This is t equals 0. OK, what in the world does this integral represent when it comes to the graph? What? Area under the curve. Yep, area under the curve from x equals 1. So that's our starting t value. If x is greater than 1, so let's say x is greater than 1, the area that we're going to look at is this area right here that I just shaded in. So let's write down some nice and easy properties from here. So let's compute natural log of 1. So remember that is not our t value, but that's our x value is 1. So when I write ln of 1, that's the x value. So remember back to your antiderivative rules, what is the area under the curve from 1 to 1? Zero. zero. So this is start and end at the same, in this case, t value, and you're going to get zero area. So that's the reason natural log of 1 is zero, right there. So there are some review problems in your homework, and there are, I think, 1.4 and 1.5. I've talked about them before a little bit. But they are there to review your natural log and exponential properties. Does anybody remember the natural log of E? So this cancels out to 1. So why in the world is that? ln of e is the integral from 1 to e. What number is e close to? 2.71. So where I drew this x looks like it's pretty close to 2.71, close enough at least. So let's call this e right here. So if we know this equals 1, what this tells us is e is the number 
such that the amount of area that I shaded in is 1. So E is the number, how is the amount I have to go to the right in order to get 1 as the area that I just shaded in. Now this is not a nice rectangle or a trapezoid or any nice shape. So it's not going to have a nice value of 3 or 4 or any other number. So this is defined to be the number such that the area is 1. So that's the definition of what E is. So E is the number such that the area under from 1 to E is 1. So I drew the graph as if uh, E or, or X really is greater than 1. What happens if x is between 0 and 1? So what happens when x is between 0 and 1? I'll redraw the graph quickly. So what is weird about this interval when we go to integrate it? We're going to start at 1 and end at x. It's going the wrong way. It's going the wrong way. So what does that mean? It looks like the area is positive. If I shade it in, it's all above the x-axis. The problem is we're going the wrong way. So what does that mean about our area computation? It'll all be negative. So ln is negative when x is small between 0 and 1. So if x is between 0 and 1, you're going to get negative value for your natural log. So it's all counted as neg negative area because you're going to the left. So normally we compute area from smaller uh, value to bigger one. This time we're going to big to small, so we get negative. So next thing we're going to do is take a derivative. So I don't know anything about the derivative. So there are two ways to go about this. You could try to apply the derivative to the definition. That's about all we know about natural log right now. All the other properties you have to forget. So we're taking the x derivative of this t integral. So there's a fundamental theorem of calculus. The first version said the derivative cancels the integral. This right here is set up perfectly for the fundamental theorem part one, where the derivative cancels the interval, the integral. All we needed was a constant in the bottom, and then our x had to match the dx right there. So we got those two going on, and we can cancel this out very nicely. You just replace t by x right there. This is fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Was the derivative cancels the antiderivative. So 
So there is our derivative of natural log is 1 over x. And that should make a lot of sense because the definition, it was the antiderivative of the 1 over t function. So the derivative will be cancel out the antiderivative part. So there's the derivative of the function. Now one thing, you're going to learn every derivative, you get a free antiderivative in calculus. So every derivative comes with a free antiderivative. So what antiderivative did we get? So if the derivative of the left equals the right, that means if I move the derivative operator to the other side, just like with functions, I have to move it to the other side as the inverse. So what that means is the antiderivative, the integral of 1 over x dx is ln x, and you have to add the plus c in. So the integral of 1 over x dx is the natural log plus a constant. So there's our free antiderivative. And of course, 1 over x is x to the negative first power dx. What is the only power that didn't work with the anti-power rule? This one. Every other exponent, you could use the anti-power rule. x to any other power, you could just add one to the power, divide by the new power. Why does this one not work? What, what do you get if you add 1 to negative 1? 0. Zero. So the antiderivative is, is not a constant. It's not x to the 0 power. So that should be a plus you should be divided by 0 if you keep going. So the fact that it's constant and undefined should make you hit the brakes and realize, ah, it's not what I should be doing here. So this is the one exponent that doesn't follow the anti-power rule. So there's a derivative. Let's do some computations that involve the chain rule and maybe a little bit more. So we just learned a derivative. Let's compute a few. So first one, we'll do natural log of 2x. And the second one, derivative of natural log x to the fifth over x minus 1. So compute these two derivatives right now. I'll give you a minute. You definitely need chain rule. The second one, you're going to need quotient rule also. So I wrote the chain rule out with natural log of f of x. So natural log of a function is 1 over that original function, 1 over the input f of x times derivative of the inside, which is f prime of x. So this is how you're going to be using the chain rule with natural log.
hopefully I did all that algebra right. There's a lot of cancellation happening. So the first one should be pretty straightforward. Just a little chain rule. 2 cancels the half, basically, and you get 1 over x. Second one, a lot more complicated. Some quotient rule jumps in here, and I tried my best to simplify. Now in answering web work questions, you could simplify all the way, or you could just go with your first. As soon as you don't have a derivative anymore, technically this is the derivative right here that I put a box around. It's very unsimplified, but web work should take that as an answer if you're having trouble answering yours in. A lot of times it's faster to simplify than type in some crazy parenthesized fraction of fractions. Yeah, actually I will. I can see exactly where it came from. So I see your quote. It's all laid out. The chain is very obvious. The second part's for the chain rule, and then the what's inside that huge parentheses, the quotient rule. If we get that answer, but then try to simplify it, but we can't, we're having issues for just some reason. I'll usually so take one point off if you try to simplify and it doesn't work out. Yes. Yeah, so that x shouldn't be there, which means that. So that should just be. Nice. Oh, it makes it way simpler then. 5 minus 6, so that's minus x. Oh, it's really nice derivative. Oh no. Uh, just circle the big one up there and leave it alone. So you have 5x minus 5 minus x. So 5x minus x, 4x minus 5. Does that look better? Yeah. All right. So let's do something very similar. Except I'm, instead of a 2, I'm going to put a b in place. So since so we saw this work with a 2, it'll work with any b that is not 0. As long as you're not divided by 0, this will work out. If x is less than 1, we let b equal negative 1. So this becomes ln of negative x. And because x is less than 0, that means negative x is greater than 0. So if x is negative, that means negative x will be positive. So that means ln of negative x is OK. And we can take ddx ln minus x. It'll be 1 over minus x times minus 1. And just like before, those will cancel out to 1 over x. So if x is positive or negative, you could get the exact same derivative. So whenever x is not 0, you could do the derivative of the absolute value of x.
and that works whenever x is not equal to zero. So there is quite a few times absolute value comes into play in Calc 2. I'm not going to make a very big deal about putting absolute values everywhere, so I won't take off points if you miss out on the absolute values. So I'm not going to make a big deal about putting absolute values around. If you're making a bridge or sending a rocket into space, negatives are really important, so make sure you pay attention to them. But for our purposes, it'll just mostly be annoying and get in the way. So I'll write down when we get them, but I don't expect you to use them on your um, quizzes and midterms. So there'll be quite a few times where absolute value comes into play. So I just redefined, well, I didn't really redefine, I defined what natural log was. Does it actually follow all the rules that you should have remembered from natural log in pre-calculus class? So how many log rules can you remember? I'm going to write them as natural log. What is ln of a times b? ln a plus ln b. So that was the first log rule. That multiplication inside is addition outside. And next one we'll do, what about natural log of a divided by b? Yep, subtraction. And next up, we'll do the exponential. ln of a to the b power. What can we do with that exponent b? Yep, this turns into a coefficient or a product, b times ln a. So you could bring powers outside. And it's a little bit redundant. You could get this property for free with b is neg equals negative 1. But natural log of a to the negative first power is negative natural log of a. So we'll do the proof of the first one. So we don't, when we prove this, we don't know that it's equal yet. We want to show that it's equal. So you never want to start with, hey, this thing is already true. So we're trying to prove this. So I'm going to take a derivative of both sides. This would be bad to do. We've done plenty of this before, but in this instance, it would be bad to do this. If I take the x derivative of this equation, I'm starting off by assuming this equation is already true. So I don't want to start off assuming that's true. So I don't know if they're equal. So I'm going to take that equal sign out. So separately, I'm computing the derivative of each of these. So we'll draw a line down the middle. I don't know they're equal. So we'll go derivative separately and then see what we get. And maybe we can compare those two. So I don't want to say they're equal right away. That's what I'm trying to show. All right, first derivative. It's 1 over AB, that's the derivative of the natural log, times AB prime. So it's 1 over what's inside times the derivative of what's inside. On the right side, what rule can I use with the derivative of something plus something else? How do I treat derivative of a sum? You take the derivative and do it for each. Yep, yeah, basically distribute the derivative. It's a sum rule. So it's derivative of the first plus derivative of the second. So it acts a lot like distribution. And these two are very easy. 1 over a. We don't know uh, anything about a, so I'm just going to write 1 over a times a prime plus 1 over b times 
b prime. So it looks like a prime over a plus b prime over b. And that's about as simple as it's going to get. How do I do derivative of a times b? What rule do I need? There's no powers here. Nope. Product rule. So a times b derivative, so it's a prime b plus a b prime. So that's the product rule. And now I'm going to distribute my coefficient a prime b over a b plus a b prime over a b. We cancel the b's in the first, the a's in the second. Oh no. Ugh. There we go. So we get a prime over a, b prime over b. Hey, that's the same thing. Well, that's encouraging. Unfortunately, what we just showed is their derivatives are equal. So you got two functions who have the same derivative. So what does that tell us about the functions themselves? So let's summarize. So if we write this out a little bit more simple, this basically means you got two functions who have equal derivatives. How does that, what does that mean about the relationship between f and g themselves? Not their derivatives. Their derivatives are exactly the same. What does that tell you about the two functions? So if I drew graphs of f and g, and you know their derivatives are the same, what does that mean about the graphs of f and g themselves? So their slopes are the same at every point. So how can two graphs be different but have the same slope at every point? They're parallel. You could almost say they're parallel, although we have to bend the definition of parallel a little bit. But they're off. They're always different by a constant. So one of them is basically shifted up or down from the other one. But they have the exact same slope if you trace them out. So if you move one of them up or down, it would fit right on top of the other graph. So you got two functions that have the same slope, so they're off by a constant. So you can write fx equals g of x plus c, and they're off by some constant. Some constant c that works for all x in the domain of f, which better equal the domain of g, or else you didn't have the same. Um, if you have your derivatives are equal, then your domains had to match also. So let's take this intuition back to here. So this means ln a b equals ln a plus ln b plus constant. So what are some really nice numbers to plug in for a and b? That would make this work out really well. And don't say 0, because you can't take natural log of 0. So that's out. E is pretty good. We can go even easier. Let's go with 1. How about that? Why is 1 great? Natural log of 1 is 0. Not 1. That's sort of a trick question. Natural log of 1 is 0. So a lot of these are going to be 0. So I'm going to choose a equals 1 and b equals 1. So good news is 1 times 1 is also 1. So we have natural log of 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. And natural log of 1 is still 0. So 0 equals c. So how different are they? They're not different at all. They're the exact same graph, or exact same function. So 
So that's what we were trying to show. Natural log of AB is natural log A plus natural log B. So I'll just put all these log rules in a box. These should be a review. So you probably don't need them on your cheat sheet, but in case they're not, you may want to put them on your cheat sheet for now. If you do the log homework, uh, the review homework section, most of this will probably come back. Hopefully you just need this on your cheat sheet for the homeworks, and then you can erase it off your cheat sheet very soon. So there's our rules, algebraic rules. Now we're going to look at properties of the graph. So they all come from the 1 over t graph, so we'll graph that out. So I want to get a lower bound for the area between 1 and 2. So if I draw the full area between 1 and 2, it looks like this. And I can shade this in. There's not a good way to compute this exact value right here, though. So what I'm going to do instead is get an estimate. So it's pretty obvious that little rectangle I drew is smaller than the area we want. What is the area of this rectangle that I just shaded in? One half. One half. Why is that? Yep, so we got a width of 1 and our height at 2, our y value is 1 half. So we got a height of 1 half. And actually, I want to write inside of this. It's probably not possible. Oh. All right, so our area is one half of in that little rectangle. Would a good approximation be three fourths for the whole thing? It seems reasonable because it looks like it's about half of that, but all I can say is it's about half of that rectangle. So close to a fourth, another fourth, but this actually bends down a little bit, it doesn't go straight. So it's a little bit less than that. Now as to how much less, that's a much more tricky question. I think 3 fourths is a decent estimate, yes. So we saw ln 2 from 1 to 2, dt. And this is going to be greater than 1 half. So we said for sure the area is more than a half, looking at the graph. So just using the log properties, natural log of 2 to the nth power is natural log of 2 times n. So that exponent becomes a coefficient. So this ln 2 to the n is greater than n over 2. So I just use that estimate. Natural log of 2 is bigger than a half. So if I put a half in its place, that term becomes a little smaller. 
So this means natural log of 2 to the n is more than n over 2. So easy question, what is the limit as n approaches infinity of n over 2? So this is a calc 1 limit. So you could write it as 1 half times the limit n approaches infinity of just n. So you get half of infinity, also known as infinity. So we get n over 2, and n gets bigger and bigger, we get infinity. Now, if you remember the sandwich theorem, natural log 2 to the n is more than n over 2. So that means the limit also has to be greater than or equal to the limit we just computed. So that narrows it down to what the limit is very quickly. The limit is greater than or equal to infinity. So what is the limit? Infinity. It has to be infinity. So the only reason we use 2 to the n instead of just n or x, the reason we use 2 to the n is so we can use this geometric property where we did lower bound with that little rectangle and then use the algebraic property to uh, estimate the limit of 2 to a li ln of 2 to a big number. So we use that 2 to the n so the algebra will work out really nice. All right, so if this limit is infinity, if I replace 2 to the n by just x, this will give me the same result. So 2 to the n gets really big. I could replace it with x. So what does this mean in the graph? I'm going to scroll way up to the original graph. So what happens if x keeps going all the way to the right? What we're then computing is the area all the way to infinity. And what did we just conclude? That that amount of area is actually infinite, even though it looks like it's getting really tiny. If you keep adding it up, it is infinity. So that's what the intuition on the graph means. So we keep moving x to the right. That area gets bigger and bigger. And you can get any, uh, you can get as close, as big of a number as you want. The two areas that I just shaded in are the exact same size. So why are they the same? There's a few ways to see this. That line I just drew right there, y equals x. If you reflect the graph, you get the same graph. So that means this function is its own inverse. That's another way to think about this. So multiply by x, you have xy equals 1, divide by y. So we just basically inverted the function, and it's its own inverse. So these two regions are the same size.
So if these regions are the same size, and I already said there was infinite area down here, how much area do I get if I do the full that box plus all this right here? Infinity plus one, technically. You get that infinity plus that little tiny box at the bottom. But it's still infinity. So the area between zero and one, ooh. It should be negative infinity plus one. We're gonna count it all backwards. We get negative infinity. So natural log of zero is negative infinity. Well, should be a little more careful. I should write it with the limit. So limit x approaches zero of natural log x is negative infinity. So I wrote this down earlier, but we'll rewrite it here. This is the antiderivative that we got for free. So if u is a diffable function, and it's never equal to 0, then integral 1 over u du equals ln u plus c. So you're going to find that if you write antiderivatives down, you want to write them with u's because you're going to do u substitution a lot. So u is a very good letter to use instead of writing x's in your antiderivatives. u is a very good letter. It'll make your brain think about u sub always. So this antiderivative of x over x squared minus 5. We're going to find this antiderivative. Does this look like 1 over u? Not quite. So the only trick we really know is u substitution. So is there a u that we could pick? Remember, the worst choice is u equals x. That won't get you anywhere, so don't go with that. Is there a choice for u so that du or something very close to du is left? Yeah, let's try the x squared minus 5. So du 2x dx. I don't see a 2. I do see an x dx. So we're going to move that to the other side with a half. And now I see x dx, and we can make our u sub. So x dx is du, and x squared minus 5 is u. Now remember with the uh, endpoints, I'm going to leave them out until I get back to x's. You have a choice, and I'm going to use, I'll use the highlighter there. You could use endpoints, or you could leave them out. But if you leave them in, you better write u endpoints while you're hanging around with u's. So I'm going to leave them blank. All right, easy part. What is antiderivative 1 over u du? Ln u. So that's the antiderivative we have right there. I told you don't need to worry about absolute value, so I'm going to just write it with parentheses instead of absolute value. Ln x squared minus 5. Now that I'm back to x's, I can write endpoints 0 to 2. So now I'm back in x's, and it makes sense to have endpoints in x's now. And finally, we're going to compute this. 1 half times ln 2 squared minus 5. Ooh, we better have absolute value now. We're about to have negative minus 
ln 0 squared minus 5. Two squared minus five is negative one minus ln negative five. All right, what is natural log one? It'll be zero minus ln five. And there's not much you can do to that. It's okay to get negatives in an, anti, uh, in an antiderivative. The only time it's bad is if you're trying to get something like total or net change, or if you're trying to find uh, the area, the positive or total area between two functions. Then you may need to be careful about which one's on top and bottom.